Hey guys, it's Wahima, but just call me Wah. Melanated! Welcome to another episode of Love After Lockup. This is my recap of season three, episode... What is the real episode? Because I'm sick of this. Season two, episode 28, which really it's season three, episode five. Let's jump right into this video. Oh, first, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel if you're already not subscribed to my channel, and check out my merch below. First, we're gonna start start off with Lacey and Sean. Lacey woke up, got a text from John, or whatever his name is, and she ignores it, tells Sean it's no one important. Then that later that day, they go and get dinner. So then we have the obligatory scene where he meets the friend. What are your intentions with my friend? And if you do anything to her, I will kill you. I went to prison when I was a kid, so I'm ready to be an adult. And Miranda's like, great, but don't forget that I will kill you. And we're just like, but your friend is the one that's being dirty McGurdy's and doing the dirty McGurdy's things. Like, what What are you, why are you even coming at Shane this way? He's just like an innocent bystander in, in Lacey's tangled web. Lacey's lips look bad when she doesn't have lipstick on it. Like, she doesn't look bad without makeup, but her lips look bad without makeup, which is odd. Maybe it's because there's filler and stuff in them. So the next couple that we're gonna talk about is Vince and Amber. So Vince and Amber are getting off to a kind of awkward, rocky start. Amber is just not sure about Vince. She's starting to think about a lot of things that she had never thought about. So they go bed shopping because she needs a bed. She just doesn't have anything. And they go to this retailer and they lay on a Tempur-Pedic mattress, which I'm just like, I mean, how fancy that he's buying you a Tempur-Pedic. Like, I don't have a Tempur-Pedic. Like, to me, Tempur-Pedic is like people who got money or back problems, you know? So he gets her a Tempur-Pedic mattress and he makes some comment about, it's funny how we're laying here, you know, together on this mattress, but we're not laying together in real life. And she's just like, yeah. She keeps telling him, like, I'm really grateful for everything you're doing for me. We just need to take things slow. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. You know, she's not even pretending that she's going to have sex with him. She's saying that obviously we need to get to know each other. But thank you for all the kind things you're doing and the things that you said you were going to do. So stop complaining, <laughs> basically. So they get the mattress back to the place that she's staying, which is with Kathy, who's Puppy's mom. Puppy is her ex Bunky. And Vince has to show everybody that the reason why he works out is specifically so that he can move heavy ass mattresses into homes. That mattress is heavy and he like puts it on his back like He-Man and like carries it into the house. At some point he does need help. Then he builds a frame and she's like, are you sure you don't need anything? You don't need help? And he's like, nah, I can do it. He's like, but can you give me some water? And she's like, okay. So she brings him a cup of water and they set up the bed and then they go and lay on it. And he asks Kathy to take a picture of her and him on the bed. And she again, tells him that she's really, really grateful for everything that he's done, but tonight she's gonna stay there with Kathy. Vince says that he's worried about the lack of affection, that, that she's being kind of aloof and he feels like, even though he knows they've only been talking for 22 months, but that she should be more affectionate, I guess, based on the things that she said in their letters together. And I can see why he's confused, but I also, I just think it's weird that he's growing impatient with her. I think it's weird when the person who comes out of prison is expected to immediately jump into a certain behavior that the person who's not in prison expects them to exhibit. Like I just, that kind of thing is weird to me. The next couple that we're gonna talk about is Cheryl. I mean, okay, let's, there's something about Vince that bothers me. Vince, I just feel like he's controlling. And he he specifically went after a woman in prison, women in prison, because you remember he wrote 10 women and he chose from those 10. Because he's intense and like dealing with a woman in real life might be problems for, might be like problematic for him. And I just don't know what it is that he wants. And maybe he's just like, well, I don't know, it feels like grooming or, or something. Like he just wants a woman who's in a position who needs him he can give everything to, and then she can just come out and work out with him and give everything back to him. Like, what does he, what, I wanna know what their plans are. I don't know. I just, I just don't know what their plans are. And I don't even know, did he actually go see her in prison? Did he actually go visit her ever in prison? So like, 
she doesn't actually know anything about him. Like, you know, at least when you visit somebody, you get some kind of body language understanding and you're like, okay. Like, but Vince is awkward and he's like imposing. He's like Rocky, but like, it, and it's weird. Doesn't he sound like Rocky to you? But without any of the charisma? I don't know. Okay, so the next couple that we're gonna talk about is Cheryl and Josh. So Josh has been out of prison for four hours and they're gonna go get something to eat. She's still upset because she found out that she's not gonna be able to live in a hotel or a motel with Josh for the three months that she can. So she gets there, they're having dinner and his mother sits down and we know that Cheryl is pissed. Cheryl doesn't even say hi to the mom. It is an awkward exchange from Jump Street, okay? And Cheryl is just like sitting there being petulant as a 30 year old grown ass woman. And his mom then hits with a low blow. She's like, so where are your kids? And Cheryl's like, with my parents. Basically Josh's mom is like, oh, so you're just gonna leave your kids for three months while you just stay here in Colorado and figure something out with my son? That seems responsible. Sounds like a good mom to me. And they're just having a conversation as though Cheryl isn't there and Josh is just trying to be happy and make it work and mom is just eating french fries and Cheryl is just sitting there. And because Cheryl doesn't wanna participate in the conversation because she's being a baby, she gets up and leaves because no one's talking to her. And Josh is just like, oh God, what's going on? Josh's mom is like, look, Cheryl can't stay at my place, okay? I'm not comfortable with that. She can't stay with us because she got my husband a beer when she knew she wasn't supposed to get him a beer. So it's all very confusing. You, we think that maybe there's some kind of tension between Cheryl and Josh's mom due to, I don't know, what? But I especially was not expecting it to be because Josh's mom thinks that Cheryl is going after her husband. So here's what they say happened. That I guess no one was supposed to get the man a beer or I don't know, girl, maybe Cheryl, maybe Josh's mom was like, I'm not getting you another beer. He, then he asked Cheryl to get him a beer and then Cheryl says, okay, and gets him a beer. And all of a sudden, Josh's mom thinks that Cheryl is trying to take her man. Was the stepdad making googly eyes at Cheryl? Like what is going on? I can't even imagine what this man looks like, but I don't imagine he's any better looking than any of the people sitting at that table. Cheryl is so mad. You would think that something had happened. Like, if someone just accused me of wanting to sleep with their husband, I would just kiki and laugh it off as like, no, I'm not, that's not what it was, was trying to happen. But the way Cheryl is so mad doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't know if it's because the mom tried to break them up saying that that's what happened. I don't know if it was some kind of big blow up. How is Cheryl even over there? Does she, Cheryl go and like try to hang out with Josh's family while he was in prison? because she said that she met Josh while he was in prison and started writing him. So I'm confused as to how Cheryl was around his family and how this whole thing went down. But Cheryl hates his mom to the point where it's she's being immature as a grown ass 30 year old woman with three kids. So Cheryl goes home to the motel and starts to cry to her sister about the situation because the sister starts to laugh at her when she figures out what's going on. And she's like, I've been waiting two years to sleep next to this man and I can't even do it now. Uh. And I'm just like, girl, if you had just smiled at that mom and said you were really sorry or whatever, maybe she would let you spend the night once or twice. Oh my God, it's just dumb. But I'm like, y'all could sleep next to each other during the day. Like, why don't you just go pick him up and then y'all just have like a little staycation in the motel, you know, three times a week then you could hold him at night or whatever. I don't know, girl, what you want. So the next couple that we're gonna talk about is Lizzie and Daniel. So they're driving back and Daniel's mother is just filled with glee. A police officer passes her and she's like, ooh, piggy piggy, you can't have him. He's already served his time. And I'm just like, whatever, piggy piggy, shut up. So they go to meet with Lizzie's mom. So they're all having dinner and Lizzie is worried that Daniel's mom is gonna say something offensive and set Lizzie's mom off. Cause she says Lizzie and her mom are best friends and she really wants her mom to like their family. And I don't know if there's some kind of like white trash tension happening or like something going on, but she really wants Teresa, who is Daniel's mom, to be on her best behavior, to impress her mom. Teresa is already feeling very defensive about her son because she thinks the sunshine shits out of her son's ass and now that he's been in jail, served his time, and is now off drugs that, you know, everything is gonna come up roses and Lizzie's not the right person for him because she has priorities that are school and work. And that she feels like 
Lizzie isn't gonna be supportive of her son. But on top of that, she also feels like because he was drunk with her the last time they were out, and because Lizzie's a grown woman who likes to have a drink, that Lizzie's drinking or whatnot is gonna pull Daniel back into some kind of behavior. And I'm thinking, that if Daniel's a grown person who knows he's an addict and he still chooses to drink, that is on him. Why is Lizzie to blame if Daniel does something crazy because of drinking? She really does think that Daniel's like a great kid, which I'm just like, I don't know how. They start to have that conversation and Teresa keeps it together because she knows she's in front of Lizzie's mom. She asks Lizzie's mom, like, what do you think of the situation? And Lizzie's mom's optimistic and she's just like, look, if they stay on the straight and narrow and they do what they're supposed to do, it should be fine, only time will tell. And also I think Lizzie's mom is a little bit like, it'll be fine because her daughter's in school and at work and has never gone to prison. So she's like, why are you worried about what my daughter's gonna do? You need to be worried about the idiot sitting next to you. Don't worry about my child, she good. She was on drugs, she did those things, but she never went to prison and she's clean and she's living a clean and sober life now, except for the alcohol. But you know what I'm saying? Teresa's like, oh, where are you guys gonna go now? And the mom's like, well, they're gonna go to my house and they're gonna drink. Just gonna party, like, you know, at the house safely where they have supervision, great. <laughs> And then we have this like awkward sex scene with them in a laundry room and I didn't want to see any of it And then we have a scene of her smoking a cigarette afterward. I didn't want to see that either. It was weird It was like Clinton Tracy level love after lockup. They just brought us back So the next couple that we're gonna talk about is Angela and Tony So Angela is with Brenda and her sister and they are wedding dress shopping I mean the sister is just like Angela needs to leave his ass like he's dumb What is she doing? But Brenda's like look, you know, you got to let this play out I used men when I was in prison and I know and I feel like he might be doing the same thing to her But you can't stop it. We just need to be here and be supportive So Angie comes out in a dress and it's, they love it. I mean, it's beautiful. She looks great in it She looks great. Then she gets a call and it's Tony, so she answers the phone. And Tony's like, man, I'm in trouble. And she's like, what? Turns out that Tony's dumbass went to play basketball after work, and then he got some emails from the housing place and said, you need to come back. And he's like, well, if I go back, they're gonna lock me up and I'm not going back to prison. He decided that he was just going to throw his entire future down the drain and just go on the run. She's been talking to this man for two years. She's gone to visit him, she's given him money, she's invested in him. In the first week, he fucks it up so royally. I mean, he messes up so bad. You're not gonna be able to come back from them. That gave him an opportunity to go back. Maybe you would have served a little bit more time, but now you're on the run? That shit is stupid. So she's like, Tony, tell me where you are. Tony's like, I can't tell you. I'm not gonna tell you where I'm at. She was like, tell me what's going on, Tony, because you weren't playing basketball. Is it drugs? Is it another woman? What is it? And he's just like, I'm just really scared right now. I don't know what to do, but I know I'm not going back to prison. And then he hangs up on her and she goes back and tells her friends and they're just like, you need to leave him alone. You need to leave him alone. Angie, let him go. Angela's like, no, I need to find him. I need to go find him. So she goes back to her home. She calls her friend, Tommy. And she tells Tommy to come with her so she can go find him. Angela, girl, why? You're smarter than this. You're, you're smarter than this, I know you are. That is the end of that episode. Let's have a Kiki and a conversation down in the comments section. Let me know what you thought of this episode. I mean, it's getting good. It isn't as juicy as some of the past segments and I feel like every single couple is like dumb. You know what I'm saying? But next episode, we meet the next, uh, the last couple that we're getting onto this series. And so it's gonna be exciting because she seems like a riot. She seems like a delusional crazy riot and we love a delusional crazy riot. Ooh, Glorietta, I'm ready for Glorietta. I think I'm missing somebody from this episode, but it's okay. We'll talk about them in next episode when I remember. All right, you guys, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you already aren't. Check out the merchandise below. All right, you guys, have a fantastic day. Remember to be you, be true, and find your place. Bye.